Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Hey, Ed, how's it going? James, things are going well. Believe it or not, one of our viewers has left a comment for us. This is, uh, this comes from, this comes from Trent Goldsmith, who's a uh, high school teacher at Waverly High School in Waverly, Nebraska. Um, and he's asking us if we would uh, say something about UBI, Universal Basic Income. Yeah, no, and, and Trent stumbles across one of the few things here that you and I have had a bit of a disagreement over, you know, over what, the past year or so. Um, usually, Ant and I are, are pretty much on the same page when it comes to economic things. But every now and then we, we part company and the universal basic income is one of those things at least when all the details are, are fleshed out, that I think we might have a, an insignificant disagreement over. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that, that, that's correct. And generally speaking, I like the idea of, of universal basic income, um, provided it's done well. And I, I, having said that, I don't think there's any chance it's going to be done well if it's done at all. Yeah, but let, let's take a couple of steps backwards and and figure out at least in broad terms how we got here, right? This is kind of come into the news over what? I would say the past year, year and a half, and it's been fueled by the um kind of the the tech guys out in California, and I'm thinking specifically of Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk who, you know, sit on top of incredible fortunes and I don't know, maybe they're feeling a little guilty about that or whatever, but they, they seem, they seem to be of a mind that what they, what we need to do collectively is to provide an income for, for human beings that would remove the vagaries of making a living and allow people to live better lives. Right. So that's putting the best spin possible on. In, in, in that sense, it's it's not much difference from from the living wage argument, right? Uh, except except that with universal basic income, you're not necessarily working; you're just receiving it. Whether you work or not is irrelevant. You receive some check for a base living amount from the government, right? And how much that is, you know, that's going to be up for grabs with all kinds of debates and, and and this sort of thing. So you know, we probably do well here to keep this in the broader context of a theoretical UBI and would that in fact be a good idea if we could in fact figure out how to pull that off. And then we'll, we'll get into the weeds, I suspect a little bit, uh, a, a few minutes down the road. So why on earth, Ant, would you think that a UBI is a good idea at all when we start in basic economic theory by saying something a lot like if, if you want more of something, subsidize it. Well, what are you going to get more of here? Idleness and sloth, right? I, I think it's I think we should we should probably describe in a little more detail what the UBI is. Now now understand that Congress can take a good idea and, and make it a horrible monster, right? So I have no idea what would come out of Congress attempting to craft a UBI. But in its most basic uh, form, it looks something like the following. Every household or every person, depending on how you want to do it, pays a certain percentage of his income. So this is an extra tax we're talking about. It goes into a pot. Everybody pays the same percentage. It goes into a pot. And at the end of the year, this money in the pot gets divided up. Everybody gets a check for the same amount. So, so you can imagine people who earn little pay a percentage of their small income. So they pay a little bit into the pot and they get a check that's that's larger than that. So they, their net benefit. Um, then other people earn a lot of money. They earn a lot of money. They pay the same percentage of that, but it ends up being a very large amount that's larger than the size of the check they get back. So they end up being net payers. Low income people end up being net recipients. That's the general idea. All right. Well, maybe I'm just a crazy person here and maybe I don't see the obvious thing in, in, in front of my face. But isn't this just a very clever way to redistribute money yet again? Ab absolutely. In, in fact, in that in that sense, it's not overly different, uh, except it's more simple than, than what Social Security does now. 
It takes a, a set percentage from everybody's paycheck and it gives you back money when you retire, right? And this, this is the same general idea, except it wouldn't apply only to retirees. It would apply to everybody. But correct me if I'm wrong. Every single time we look at a scheme of redistribution, um, you you come out swinging against that, saying that this is not the smart thing to do. What we need to do is let the market forces prevail, et cetera, et cetera. And yet here, this one time, apparently, you're willing to consider it. Yeah, I, there, there's all sorts of reasons not to do this, right? It, 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 it's it's going to be distortionary. It's going to cause people to, to you know, remove their incentive to work. The, all the kinds of arguments you, you hear uh, economists making. Um, so, so in in that sense, my argument is not that the UBI is a good idea, but rather it's a better idea than the way we currently go about uh, trying to help the poor. And what we have is, is this hodgepodge of of, of programs at both you know the federal state and uh, federal level and the state level, things like. Um, you know, housing, uh, housing subsidies, food stamps, um, earned income tax credit, right? Some states give you energy credits towards your electric bill if you're low income, uh, minimum wage. All of these things together are, are, you know, probably tens or hundreds of programs we have in place to help the poor. UBI replaces all of that, in theory. All right, so... So now it actually gets a little more interesting, doesn't it? Because we do waste a lot of time, effort, and money on various programs that, that all interact with each other in strange and wondrous ways, right? Because it was built as a patchwork, a hodgepodge over time, not a rational, coherent plan that was designed to address a specific problem. Um Maybe we would be better off throwing every single thing that we now do in the trash and starting over. And this would be a really interesting way to start over. Is this, is this your perspective? Is this what I'm hearing? It certainly would be. I think the thing we have to keep in mind is that, is that economic policies, like the policies we use to help the poor, um, are not dissimilar from, from, from drugs that, that a physician might, might prescribe to someone. And you have to be very careful when, when you're taking drugs. You have to tell the physician, if you're going to get a drug to, to, to address some malady you have, make sure you, the physician knows that you're also taking other drugs because they'll interact. And the drugs may interact in ways that, that the physician never intended and causes bad things to happen. The same exact thing happens with economic policies. You impose one policy to, do, to solve one um, facet of poverty, and then you impose some other policy to, to address some other facet of poverty. And these two things can interact, and they can interact and cause bad outcomes. Good case in point, um, Clifford Thies, who's, who's an economist, uh, did a study of, of a hypothetical family of three living in Virginia, and he asked the question, is this household starts, to, starts off earning very little money, and as it starts to earn more and more money, what happens to the, to the household's uh, net income after you account not only for additional taxes the household may have to pay, but also for uh, various poverty programs that phase out as you earn more money? And what he found was these poverty programs interact in such a way that this hypothetical family of three, once it hits $20,000, it should not try to earn any more money because it will actually be worse off after all the dust settles. And this is a horrible thing. If you ask you know, any reasonable person, they'd say there's no way we should have a, pov a poverty program that penalizes you for earning more. And yet that's what we've ended up with. Yeah, that is what we've ended up with. And and the interesting thing here is that you became an economist again real quick, right, as you often do. <laughs> uh, and, and, you, and you started making efficiency arguments, right, that this would simply be more efficient than any, than any other thing we could do, indeed, more efficient than anything we, we do right now. And if you think about it for a second, it, that, that actually is undoubtedly correct, right? Because what what would we be able to get rid of if we adopted this wholesale on, on the provision that everything else has to go? 
Um, and that's always the tricky bit, right, when doing things politically. And do I think Congress will ever be able to do something like this? No, not really. So it's probably just an interesting conversation. But it is an interesting conversation, right, because there would be incredible efficiencies if we walked this road instead of the road we currently walk. Do you have any numbers to indicate just how much more efficient this sort of thing could in fact be? Yeah, so so I don't know the answer to that, right? Because there's all kinds of things going on. Now, I can tell you, no question, it would be more efficient. The only question is to what degree. Beca and the reason we know this is because uh, you would take you know, all of the people who are employed by the federal government in administering poverty welfare programs and all of the people in the private sector who are contracted to the government to help administer these programs all of the all of those jobs would go away now now people get upset when you say oh my god jobs are going away but keep in mind what's going on here the people are these are productive intelligent people when we say when we say the jobs will go away what we mean is these productive intelligent people will be freed up from doing jobs that that currently aren't contributing much to the economy they'll be able to turn around start doing other things that do contribute more to the economy without us losing any of the of the benefits to to poverty uh, you know to poor people that we currently have yeah no it would ha it would have the net effect of slicing off an entire level of bureaucracy and putting it putting yeah. it to, to bed right it would just be gone and generally speaking that sort of thinking makes me kind of happy um generally speaking now Curiously, notice what we haven't talked about here. And we haven't talked about the very thing that brings the Silicon Valley types to the universal basic income in the first place. And that's the, the core belief, and I think it is an absolute core belief, that any number of jobs are going to be lost, irretrievably lost, to automation over time. Right? That's how these guys get here in the first place. And we really, we don't really put a lot of stock in that sort of argument, right? That Economies don't behave that way. Yes, jobs will be lost. New jobs will be will be created in in the in the bargain, and somewhere down the road, equilibrium happens. Right. Right. Yeah. Th this is this is correct. It, it, as long as it is the case that automation you know replaces replaces jobs, but you get you get interesting effects. For example, uh, when the ATM came along, people said, "Well, this is going to be the death of of human bank tellers." And the interesting thing that happened is that the, the number of tellers per bank on average dropped 40%. And, and people said, see, this is exactly what automation does. It, it destroys human jobs. But the other interesting thing that happened is because the number of tellers per bank dropped 40%, it was now cheaper to open uh, bank branches. And so banks found it profitable to open branches in places that were underserved, that branches never existed before. And in total, the number of branches increased by a large amount so that the number of human tellers actually went up after the ATM, not down. Yeah, no, and for this argument to hold, ultimately, you'd have to go back in time and explain to people why Henry Ford's um, new modes of production we're going ultimately to put all all people out of work. And, and you know, we all know, looking back on it, that the, the burgeoning automotive industry employed far more people in the end than than did the horse and buggy industry. And, and yet, you know, there was there were some short term problems when it, it came to employment with, with automation and factories that people, you know, prior to that just never experienced, right? So these sort of convulsions in the labor market are simply going to happen, but it's long been our point of view that they, they, they pass. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think what's very instructive is to, is to take just two data points, um, United States in the 1700s versus United States today. And what's the difference? Well, in, in today, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 times the number of jobs that existed in the 1700s. And yet we have gone through two autom automation revolutions, the Industrial Revolution and the Information Revolution. And despite those two revolutions that, that are creating all this uh, automation, it didn't exist. We have 100 times the number of jobs today that we had uh, prior. Right. So last word on the UBI for, for the week? Well, I, I, think, I think the final word is this. The UBI, in theory, is a great idea provided 
that you use it to replace the entire suite of poverty slash welfare programs, everything from stuff we, we associate with traditional welfare to things that we tend not to associate with welfare as much, like minimum wage, like social security. If you replace all of that with a UBI, you actually gain. You, you, the economy, in, in, in my opinion, will become uh, more efficient. The worst case scenario is that you impose the UBI on top of the welfare system we have now. And that's a recipe for disaster. Which probably makes it most likely. Anyway, that's all we've got time for this week on Words and Numbers. Come on back next Wednesday around about noon Eastern time for, an, for another episode. Until then, check out all the great content at fee.org and at fee online uh, and social media. And we'll see you next week. Take care, Ant. See you next week, James.